Welcome. Good morning, everyone, or Good afternoon, morning. if you're in another time zone. And we just have an absolutely wonderful group of people with us today. In no particular order, I'm just going to follow my screen to start with Professor Renita Randall, Professor Emerita from the University of Dayton School of Law, and one of the leading experts nationally on race and the law in many, many respects. <laughs> Tina Patterson, coming to us from Germantown, Maryland, <laughs> mediator, arbitrator, with lots of business experience in her background as well. <laughs> Rebecca Ratliff from Suwannee, outside of Atlanta, Georgia, <clears throat> with years of experience at the executive level in the insurance industry, as well as mediation and arbitration experience, just back from a groundbreaking trip to London to open the JAMS offices over there. <clears throat> and Ben Davis, Professor Emerita, Dude Emeritus from University of Toledo School of Law, and international raconteur, scholar, and man about town. And Ben, you were just sharing with us something about your dog and your cat that you hoped might be a model for some of the rest of us. Hey, you want to replay that for us? <laughs> sure. Uh, I, did want, I did want to start by saying that we figured out yesterday that the, fee, the equivalent for dude emeritus for a retired female professor is a queen emerita. Okay, so we have dude emeritus and queen emerita. So Professor Randall, I want to throw that out as a title to have thank queen you. emerita, okay? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know what? Every I, I just thought, well, what's the dude emeritus? What applies to me? Thank you. Yeah, well, because we worked on dudette, but dudette didn't sound like it worked. And somebody came up with Queen Emerita. I said, yes, that is the equivalent. So, so uh, the, the, the particular story, it's a true story, is I have a, a, a pug beagle, a puggle, and four cats. And the pug beagle's name is Bash. And one of the cat's names is Simba. And I walk Bash regularly in the neighborhood. And so there's the dog, and Simba of the four cats will always walk with him. And I, in my neighborhood, everyone is amazed to see this cat walking the dog. And they go <laughs> up next to each other, and they smell noses, and they smell the derrieres and that, and the, and the cat walks on the ground, and, and then it goes off. You know, the cat is off on, on its own, and the leash, uh, the dog is on the leash because the dog will run off. And I've said to people is that if cats and dogs can figure it out, why can't we humans figure it out? You know what I mean? For all the things you've seen about cats and dogs going at each other, these two are so cool. In fact, with the other three cats in the house, so, you know, we've got the dog is the minority and the four cats are the majority, and everybody's cool with each other. You know, it's like they eat their food, everybody's respectful, we're not having fights all the time. In fact, there's more fights of, uh, used to be among the cats themselves than between the cats and the dog. You know, everybody's cool. They sleep on the couch together, all that stuff. So this is the, if we can figure out a way for these Americans to, actually the world, to treat each other like those cats and those dogs, what a wonderful world it would be. Thank you. That's my speech for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. You know, and there's another thing that, is pretty thought provoking is that frequently in times of disaster and tragedy, it really brings people and communities together. You see floods where people are going, risking their lives to save not just other people, but their pets, their animals, their most prized possessions, things like that. And we've, we've heard of a number of examples of that. Social media has printed some. What are your thoughts, you four, on whether we may be approaching a time in this pandemic and all the pandemics, educational, healthcare, governance, all the areas where we're so broken, where we are so broken that the only choice left 
is to start acknowledging that we need to come together and look out for each other. Your thoughts? I don't think we're that broken. I wish we were. I mean, the, the, the truth be told, I wish we were so broken that we that people would put it aside and these and look at how we are treating individuals and change the systems that people live in but we're not that broken and i don't know that we will get that broken um i i i don't i don't, I don't see us being that broken i think we're more the same Tina, Rebecca? Thinking about those, I'm, I'm thinking about that statement. And I, I understand, I understand that, Professor Randall, and I think it's a good point. Um, we are more, more alike than we are different. And um, I think that to Ben's point, all we have to do is make some decisions. It's uh, our change, the change that we want to, to be and see is about our willingness to make certain decisions for the good of all. Um, it's not, it shouldn't be so hard to fix. I, I like Ben's point because um, there's, an, there's an embracing of diversity <laughs> between the dog and the cat. And um, they, they live together, they sleep together, they work together, and we all do the same. But there is just, um, with humans, uh, sometimes, you know, we, we know too much. And because we know so much, we fail to see the obvious. Well, I think Tina? part of the problem, go ahead, Tina, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Professor Randall, I can wait. Go ahead. Please continue no. your thought. I'll speak. My, my, my concern is that systems cause stuff, not individuals. Individuals, and we function within broken systems. And that while we can all sing kumbaya and get along, that doesn't change the systems we work in. And I don't know that, that the way we're broken, maybe we are broken, but the way we're broken isn't one in which people are going to give up on their view of how the systems ought to work. And so I don't see criminal justice being fixed. I don't see healthcare being fixed. I don't see capitalism being thrown out. Uh, those are all things that would need to happen in my mind. And I just don't know that, that we're broken in such a way that people are gonna come together and do those things. I think they're, when I talk healthcare law, one of the things I, I would, we would talk about is the willingness to help an identified person and a flood is an identified thing, uh, but total unwillingness to do anything for the masses. So one, per, one child falls down a well and yeah, the world will come together to get that child out of the well. Meantime, thousands and hundreds of thousands of children at the same time time are dying around the world. So I don't know that we're broken enough to fix that problem. Tina. And I, it's interesting, Professor Randall, what you would, you would bring that concept for, because when I heard the question, I thought of it on two levels. One, I thought about the systemic, and I think we recognize that systems are broken, and the systems that you mentioned, Professor Randall, are excellent examples, but within those systems, are we really ready to make a change? And this is where we, we see in the news and the media and other outlets, people recognizing the systems aren't working, but what is the answer and trying to navigate that. But I also think to answer your question specifically, Chuck, there's also the individual. And we, this, if nothing else, this past, I'd say 18 months, 20 months has shown us that the, where the systems aren't working or where we believe the systems have been working, but we can't sustain those systems personally on the individual level, we're having more of these conversations about self-care and saying no, and I can't do this. 
And this runs contrary to what we in the United States as a very highly individualistic culture, what? You're not going to do that, but everybody else is doing that. I mean, at one point, the conversation was fear of missing out. And people are saying, I'm good with missing out. I I'm good. I, I need to do this for me because for my sanity. And I think between the two, the systems that are broken, we recognize and we're trying to repair or patch or literally needing to have that conversation and saying, throw everything out. But where do we start? that's where we find ourselves in the tailspin. When you combine that with this whole idea of individuals saying, you know, um, I'm torn between this. Do I follow along to get along? Or do I literally say, I need to check out for 10 minutes. I need to check out for 10 days, or I just need to check out. This is not, this is not working for me. And what does work for me? And it makes me more of that individual when what we're literally struggling with is, do I still remain part of this overall collective or mm -hmm. do I become the individual? And I, I, I hope I'm making sense. But the, yeah, when you um, asked that question, about, I thought about it on the on the two le levels, because even as practitioners, we we we're struggling with this. What, what do we teach our young people? What do we personally do in terms of what what we offer, what we deliver? Um, and where is it at? Are there intersections in which it is a conflict? I'll, I'll pause there because I, I think I've been talking a bit. <laughs> well, well Chuck, if I can jump in, if you, let me jump in for one thing. Is uh, I want to uh, second uh, those comments uh, from Tina and, and Professor Randall um, in 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 this particular way. Um, a lot of times we use the word systemic, and people kind of lose it understanding what that means, right? You know. So to me, you start to get these images or these senses of systemic stuff, right? With the examples like I learned uh, recently in an article that uh, at one company, Amazon, you know, they have a turnover rate of 3% a week. That's a system that is expecting that your workers are gonna change 3% a week. So 150% in a year. And so the way that whole thing operates is geared to that kind of treatment of workers, right? That to me is a system that, you know, whether you are the smartest worker or the least smart worker, you are caught in a machine, almost like that Charlie Chaplin image of, you know, modern times, right? Uh, another one that is, uh, of course, we, we can talk about the criminal justice system and all these other systems and the, how they just grind people, you know? in a certain kind of chew them up and spit them out thing, right? Um, there are also things like, uh, let's talk about credit ratings, right? <laughs> you know, it's not, you know, the credit rating system plays a whole role for so many different things. Um, there's even this thing that I've been thinking about there, like if you apply for a job and it's outsourced to somebody to verify who you are, right? Well, one of the things they do is they go around on the internet and look at everything you ever posted on the internet as part of building that up. I think I heard that somebody was applying to be a FINRA arbitrator and they were asked, do you have a Facebook account? So they're gonna take, a, I'm like, hey man, wait a minute, slow down. Why do you need to know whether I post pictures of my dog and my cat on Facebook with as part of evaluating whether I'm a proper person to be a FINRA arbitrator. You see what I'm saying? And I, I, you know, I just thought this was very bizarre, but it's like, well, there might be something you said once somewhere that will bother somebody. You know, I mean, this is, that's what the parties do if they want to vet you to decide whether they're going to challenge you or not. But me is trying to get on a list to be considered by FINRA. Why do I have to, you know, why do you have to be those gatekeepers? But that's a system that they've got in place that has a way of locking people out. You know, see what I'm saying? And, and it's all those kinds of things that we're all, you know, even the process of how you uh, get tenure, you know, the faculty decide something, the dean decides something, but it, that's a system. And there's certain rules as to what's acceptable or not, or even the evaluating law schools. There's the US News and World Report rankings for law schools or anything. That's a system. No one controls them. It's just somebody's got a business that's there. 
The last thing I wanted to emphasize in all these systems is somebody's making money. <laughs> somebody's making big money on it being broken. This is exactly what they want, okay? Because yeah. they, they won't have the kind of things that people would think like higher pay for workers, health care for people, uh, God knows what else I can think of. There's somebody who this is an advantage for them. And I once heard somebody who used to do the Davos Forum who said to me once that, you know, you don't have to have the respect to everybody. That was just their attitude. And well, it's I think cold, isn't it? It's cold. But that's, you know, that kind of, there's an attitude like that. And then, um, or as, as a CEO once told me, because of the terrible things I have to do, I have to have fun. Okay, he said that to me about a, a conversation at one point. It was a to how dark it is, okay? And, you know, if somebody looks at they've got an angle here, there are people who do a lot for a dollar, right? You know, what is it, run over your mother to get a job? You know what I mean, for a dollar, that kind of thing? Remember that image? So, well, you know, when I, when uh, as a public health nurse, I was a, both a public health nurse that helped an individual. And when, they, when you're helping an individual, you help that individual make the best choices they have in the circumstances they're in. You, you help them to come to deal with the reality of their situation and make the best choices they can. Now, those choices may not be very good. <laughs> they don't have roads. They don't have a supermarket. They, those, those are system issues. When I was in the maternal child nurse, it always upset me when people wanted to talk about counseling the individual. I'm like, no, that's the nurse in the field problem. We are systems people. We focus on how do we change the system so that the system is better than what it is. And my problem, and this is why the recently pulls in something that the, there's been a lot of a kind of celebration of the black billionaires. Personally, I think billionaires are obscene, no, whether they're black and with one billion dollars are 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 gates, because nobody makes that kind of money without having systems that oppress the economics of the working class. I was thinking that oh, we have some working class billionaires. That's all the new billionaires now. They, get, they have all their money, but they got so much money that they won't be working class billionaires for long. They'll be actually capital billionaires. But, but the system we have is fundamentally, the, the one getting back to Chuck's question that's broken, is capital the American capital system as set up in a way so that we don't give we don't give a lot of things that you find in other capitalist systems? And the question becomes, how do we how do we fix that? Can we fix that? And my answer is no, I don't think we can fix it, but I think the <laughs> Everybody's made um, in incredible points. So the systems are broken. They were built crooked and the bias is baked in, <laughs> which is why the behaviors are enabled. And so um, I, I, I was uh, listening to everybody talk and I drew this cycle, with, you know, arrows out. Um, it's, it's cyclical, really. Um, you know, the, not the structures of racism and the structures of capitalism. And you said it, uh, Ben, somebody's making money. And um, so while somebody is making money, it's, it's hard to straighten out um, a, a system that was built crooked. And it was built crooked for a reason. It wasn't, uh, it was on purpose. And, and that's what we're dealing with. So I do really appreciate the perspectives about broken, uh, broken systems. And of course, people who are raised in those systems and who work in those systems and who try to thrive in those systems, which brings us back to the point of privilege, which was a topic we were talking about off camera. Um, there's, yeah, there is a, a caste system and uh, it's here in the United States uh, more recently was um, brought back to mind. We know there's a caste system. 
but you know now there are a lot of conversations about about of course the book the book cast by Isabel Wilkerson is a very popular book that's a book club book now because um there is the acknowledgement that there is a caste system and all of that goes into play into this brokenness that that we have at, in in our systems yeah uh, if, if i can jump in there um something else it just occurred to me like on the systems thing um there was a, a fundraiser for unicef that was done over the last month called arbitration idol it was called like american idol they had a bunch of us there people could bid on each of us and then if they could if they won um they would get 30 minute a uh, 30 minute zoom interview right and so i did that uh to help out my friend chris campbell and um uh, this young person won who happened to be an intern in a place and you know i'm trying to give her my best advice about self-promotion i mean because you got to promote yourself right you know and uh and i happen to know some of the top people at that same firm so you know i can mention you two and apparently there are all kind of processes in place to prohibit somebody as low as that from writing up something to the person at the top, right? You know, and I was like, wow, okay, well, I'm not tired by those processes. Would you like, and I can go ahead and do it on my own, which I did. And yeah. it was fun, you know, contact and, and all that stuff. But as I thought about it, it's like, this person is getting a privilege from me in that I had worked with these people all these years. I'm outside of that structured thing and I can just go zoom to the top. And that's the way privilege works in so many different areas that somebody who's outside the game can just contact, you know, the head person and say, hey, you know, take a look out for Rebecca Radler. She's a hell of a deal, you know? And that's, and Rebecca doesn't have to sort of work her way all the way up through 35 different senior vice presidents or whatever, you know what I mean? Or Tina it's Patterson, she's somebody, or that, that Professor Randall, you know, going working her way up, you know, keep the nose to the grindstone stuff or, you know, or Chuck Prompton, you know what I mean? It, you know, all of a sudden you get a zing up to the top like that. And uh, and somebody gets on a radar screen, you know, uh, and then the mechanism for self-promotion being set up to essentially prevent the people at the bottom from making those connections sort of through the hierarchy. It's all, it's interesting to me, you know? And that brings us back then to that point that Rebecca and Tina raised and you and Professor Randall connected up is the broken systems and their impact on us is very personal for individuals. It's traumatic. It's disabling. It's mentally, emotionally damaging Ooh. to our health. And we're seeing that even in superstars, Simone Biles, Britney Spears, whoever, we're seeing that in the behavior and the attitudes of political leaders, government leaders, who one minute they're saying and doing one thing and the other they're back flipping to say, well, maybe that was a bad call. <laughs> maybe we should have had vaccines and masks. But for the individuals looking at the system, <laughs> Professor Randall, you're exactly right. The picture is one of a monolithic machine that abuses the individual. It doesn't it not only doesn't serve the individual, it actually harms and takes things away for the reasons that you folks have all talked about. So how do we connect the self-care to responses between and among us, like your cat and dog, that will help protect us from those systemic abuses? Right. at a time. I don't think that, uh, you know, we, I don't want us to go dead on air, but I've already voiced my, I don't know that there is a way. I mean, I really, truly think that, that billionaire capitalists have captured our system, that they keep, they, there are all kinds of things that can make our life better, but would cost companies money or cost more taxes, and that we are in this cycle of just trying to live our best lives the best we can. But the problem becomes is that when you don't have a privilege, and, and it can hit you, I'm going to give an example. Okay, I was in the emergency room, 
And uh, that was a whole nother issue because there was, it was packed with people who were sick uh, from COVID and other things. And two young black guys came in with uh, to visit a friend who'd been sitting there as long as I had been sitting. And they had the music on really, really loud. I was halfway down the hall from them and nobody seemed to be saying anything. So I decided to say something and they got angry. And they got angry in a way that I felt threatened. And, I, and so I told them that I told them that I was, they asked me what was I gonna do? And for a split second, my mind, I said to them, because I don't mind saying, I, I was, I was going to say, I, I'll call the security guard. That's what I will do. Okay. But for a split second, the lack of privilege in, as a Black person made me stop and think, shit. Okay, I'm sorry. I don't want to PBS. Or, <laughs> do I want if I call a security guard on them and it goes out of control because they were acting up and they get killed, I don't want to live with that the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Is my is the air in is the place that I'm in right now such that I want to risk the death of two young black guys? It is a privilege not to have to think about that. And yeah. even if I had to have to think about it just for a second, which is all I thought about it, because then I called the security guard and they dealt with it and it was all okay. So it, it isn't like anyone got killed or got hurt or got abused, but I, because I lack a certain privilege in this society when it comes to police and the people who look like me lack that privilege, I had to go through, I had to go through life thinking about that. And I'm old and I don't even know why I told that story. So someone help me out. Well, Gina or Rebecca in our last minute, final thoughts? That point of privilege, it's a reality and it plagues us daily. I agree with, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ben, I'll wait. Uh, I, I was gonna just say that, uh, you know, one thing to do if you can do it, is uh, when you go to the Dunkin' Donuts line, find out what the bill is for the person behind you and pay it for them. It's just a little thing for a complete stranger. But I saw, I did that, somebody did that for me, it made me feel wonderful. And I was at uh, also at a 7-Eleven and there was a mom with three Slurpees for a kid. She wasn't sure she had enough. And this young man, the young black man said, I'll take care of that. And you know, just just that kind of neighborly little things like that, there's not much, but it does do something to the energy, you know. And maybe that's yes. a good place for us to find up. Can we individually, despite all of these fears and anxieties and abuses from the system, take the time to take that step from privilege to allyship with and for each other? We should remember, I have to just put this in, changing individual behavior doesn't change systems. It, okay. it, maybe it makes you feel better, it makes them feel better, but the system is still whatever. I, right. I, I, I control my cursing. No, nope. the system. main thing is you fight. Okay. <laughs> and on that note, thanks everyone. Another thoughtful and thought-provoking session. Come back and join us in two weeks. Think Tech Thank Hawaii. You. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you. Take care.